Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 4, The Dialectic of Civilization. Freud attributes to the sense of guilt a decisive role in the development of civilization. Moreover, he establishes a correlation between progress and increasing guilt feeling. He states his intention to represent the sense of guilt as the most important problem in the evolution of culture and to convey that the price of progress in civilization is paid in forfeiting happiness through the heightening of the sense of guilt. Recurrently, Freud emphasizes that as civilization progresses, guilt feeling is further reinforced, intensified, is ever increasing. The evidence adduced by Freud is twofold. First, he derives it analytically from the theory of instincts. And second, he finds the theoretical analysis corroborated by the great diseases and discontents of contemporary civilization, an enlarged cycle of wars, ubiquitous persecution, anti-Semitism, genocide, bigotry, and the enforcement of illusions, toil, sickness, and misery in the midst of growing wealth and knowledge. We have briefly reviewed the prehistory of the sense of guilt. It has its origin in the Oedipus complex and was acquired when the father was killed by the association of the brothers. They satisfied their aggressive instinct, but the love which they had for the father caused remorse, created the superego by identification, and thus created the restrictions which should prevent a repetition of the deed. Subsequently, man abstains from the deed, but from generation to generation, the aggressive impulse revives, directed against the father and his successors. And from generation to generation, aggression has to be inhibited anew. Every renunciation then becomes a dynamic fount of conscience. Every fresh abandonment of gratification increases its severity in intolerance. Every Im impulse of aggression, which we omit to gratify, is taken over by the superego and goes to heighten its aggressiveness against the ego. The excessive severity of the superego, which takes the wish for the deed and punishes even suppressed aggression, is now explained in terms of the eternal struggle between Eros and the death instinct. The aggressive impulse against the father and his social successors is a derivative of the death instinct. In separating the child from the mother, the father also inhibits the death instinct, the nirvana impulse. He thus does the work of Eros. Love, too, operates in the formation of the superego. The severe father, who, as the forbidding representative of Eros, subdues the death instinct in the Oedipus conflict, conflict enforces the first communal, social relations. His prohibitions create identification among the sons, aim inhibited love, affection, exogamy, sublimation. On the basis of renunciation, Eros begins its cultural work of combining life into ever larger units. And as the father is multiplied, supplemented, and replaced by the authorities of society, as prohibitions and inhibitions spread, so do the aggressive impulse and its objects. And with it grows on the part of society the need for strengthening the defenses, the need for reinforcing the sense of guilt. Since culture obeys an inner erotic impulse which bids its bind, which bids it bind mankind into a closely knit mass, it can achieve this aim only by means of its vigilance, its fomenting, and ever increasing sense of guilt. That which began in relation to the father ends in relation to the community. If civilization is an inevitable course of development from the group of the family to the group of humanity as a whole, then an intensification of the sense of guilt resulting from the innate conflict of ambivalence from the eternal struggle between the love and the death trends will be inextricably bound up with it until perhaps the sense of guilt may swell to a magnitude that individuals can hardly support. In this quantitative analysis of the growth of the sense of guilt, the change in the quality of guilty, guiltiness, its growing irrationality, seems to disappear. Indeed, Freud's central sociological position prevented him from following this avenue. 
To him, there was no higher rationality against which the prevailing one could be measured. If the irrationality of guilt feeling is that of civilization itself, then it is rational. And if the abolition of domination destroys culture itself, then it remains the supreme crime and no effective means for its prevention are, are irrational. However, Freud's own theory of instincts impelled him to go further and to unfold the entire fatality and futility of this dynamic. Strengthened defense against aggression is necessary, but in order to be effective, the defense against enlarged aggression would have to strengthen the sex instincts, for only a strong eros can effectively bind the deconstructive instincts, or the, sorry, the destructive instincts. And this is precisely what the developed civilization is incapable of doing because it depends for its very existence on extended and intensified regimentation and control. The chain of inhibitions and deflections of instinctual aims cannot be broken. Our civilization is, generally speaking, founded on the suppression of instincts. Civilization is first of all progress in work that is, work for the procurement and augmentation of the necessities of life. This work is normally without satisfaction in itself. To Freud, it is unpleasurable, painful. In Freud's metapsychology, there is no room for an original instinct of workmanship, mastery instinct, etc. The notion of the conservative nature of the instincts under the rule of the pleasure and nirvana principles strictly precludes such assumptions. When Freud incidentally mentions the natural human aversion to work, he only draws the inference from his basic theoretical conception. The instinctual syndrome, unhappiness and work recurs throughout Freud's writings and his interpretation of the Prometheus myth is centered on the connection between curbing of sexual passion and civilized work. The basic work in civilization is non-libidinal, is labor. Labor is unpleasantness, and such unpleasantness has to be enforced. For what motive would induce man to put his sexual energy to other uses if, by any disposal of it, he could obtain fully satisfying pleasure? He would never let go of this pleasure and would make no further progress. If there is no original work instinct, then the energy required for unpleasurable work must be withdrawn from the primary instincts from the sexual and from the destructive instincts. Since civilization is mainly the work of Eros, it is first of all withdrawal of libido. Culture obtains a great part of the mental energy it needs by subtracting it from sexuality. But not only the work impulses are thus fed by aim inhibited sexuality. The specifically social instincts, such as the affectionate relations between parents and children, feelings of friendship and the emotional ties in marriage, contain impulses which are held back by internal resistance from attaining their aims. Only by virtue of such renunciation do they become sociable. Each individual contributes his renunciations, first under the impact of external compulsion, then internally. And from these sources, the common stock of the material and ideal wealth of civilization has been accumulated. Although Freud remarks that these social instincts need not be described as sublimated because they have not abandoned their sexual aims but rest content with certain, certain approximations to satisfaction, he calls them closely related to sublimation. Thus, the main sphere of civilization appears as a sphere of sublimation. But sublimation involves desexualization, even if and where it draws on a reservoir of, ne of neutral displacement energy in the ego and in the id, this neutral energy proceeds from the narcissistic re reservoir of libido, i.e. it is desexualized eros. The process of sublimation alters the balance in the instinctual structure. Life is the fusion of eros and death instinct. In this fusion, Eros has subdued its hostile partner. However, after sublimation, the erotic component no longer has the power to bind the whole of the destructive elements that were previously combined with it, and these are released in the form of inclinations to aggression and destruction. 
Culture demands continuous sublimation. It thereby weakens Eros, the builder of culture, and desexualization by weakening Eros unbinds the destructive impulses. Civilization is thus threatened by an instinctual diffusion in which the death instinct strives to gain ascendancy over the life instincts. Originating in renunciation and developing under progressive renunciation, civilization tends toward self-destruction. This argument runs too smooth to be true. A number of objections arise. In the first place, not all work involves desexualization and not all work is unpleasurable, is renunciation. Secondly, the inhibitions enforced by culture also affect, and perhaps even chiefly affect, the derivatives of the death instinct, aggressiveness, and the destruction impulses. In this respect, at least, cultural inhibition would accrue to the strength of Eros. Moreover, work in civilization is itself a great extent, to a great extent, social utilization of aggressive impulses, and is thus work in the service of Eros. An adequate discussion of these problems presupposes that the theory of the instincts is freed from its exclusive orientation on the performance principle, that the image of a non-repressive civilization, which the very achievements of the performance principle suggest, is examined as to its substance. Such an attempt will be made in the last part of this study. Here, some tentative clarifications must suffice. The psychical sources and resources of work and its relation to sublimation constitute one of the most neglected areas of psychoanalytic theory. Perhaps nowhere else has psychoanalysis so consistently succumbed to the official ideology of the blessings of productivity. Small wonder then that in the neo-Freudian schools where, as we shall see in the epilogue, the ideological trends in psychoanalysis triumph over its theory, the tenor of work morality is all pervasive. The orthodox discussion is almost in its entirety focused on creative work, especially art, while work in the realm of necessity, labor, is relegated to the background. To be sure, there is a mode of work which offers a high degree of libidinal satisfaction, which is pleasurable in its execution. And artistic work, where it is genuine, seems to grow out of a non-repressive instinctual constellation and to envisage non-repressive aims. So much so that the term sublimation seems to require considerable modification if applied to this kind of work. But the bulk of the work relations on which civilization rests is of a very different kind. Freud notes that the daily work of earning a livelihood affords particular satisfaction when it has been selected by free choice. However, if free choice means more than a small selection between pre-established necessities, and if the inclinations and impulses used in work are other than those pre-shaped by a repressive reality principle, then satisfaction in daily work is only a rare privilege. The work that created and enlarged the material basis of civilization was chiefly labor, alienated labor, painful and miserable, and still is. The performance of such work hardly gratifies individual needs and inclinations. It was imposed upon man by brute necessity and brute force. If alienated labor has anything to do with Eros, it must be very indirectly and with a considerably sublimated and weakened Eros. But does not the civilized inhibition of aggressive impulses in work offset the weakening of Eros? Aggressive as well as libidinal impulses are supposed to be satisfied in work by way of sublimation, and the culturally beneficial sadistic character of work has often been emphasized. The development of techniques and technological rationality absorbs to a great extent the modified destructive instincts. The instinct of destruction, when tempered and harnessed as it were inhibited in its aim and directed towards objects, is compelled to provide the ego with satisfaction of its needs and with power over nature. Techniques provide the very basis for progress. Technological rationality sets the mental and behaviorist pattern for productive performance, and power over nature has become practically identical with civilization. Is the destructiveness sublimated in these activities sufficiently subdued and diverted to assure the work of Eros? 
it seems that socially useful destructiveness is less sublimated than socially useful libido. To be sure, the diversion of destructiveness from the ego to the external world secured the growth of civilization. However, extroverted destruction remains destruction. Its objects are in most cases actually and violently assailed, deprived of their form, and reconstructed only after partial de destruction. Units are forcibly divided and the component parts forcibly rearranged. Nature is literally violated, only in certain categories of sub sublimated aggressiveness, as in surgical practice, does such violation directly strengthen the life of its object. Destructiveness in extent and intent seems to be more directly satisfied in civilization than the libido. However, while the destructive impulses are thus being satisfied, such satisfaction cannot stabilize their energy in the service of Eros. Their destructive force must drive them beyond this servitude and sublimation, for their aim is not matter, not nature, not any object, but life itself. If they are the derivatives of the death instinct, then they cannot accept as final any substitutes. Then, through constructive technological destruction, through the constructive violation of nature, the instincts would still operate toward the annihilation of life. The radical hypothesis of beyond the pleasure principle would stand. The instincts of self-preservation, self-assertion, and mastery, insofar as they have absorbed this destructiveness, would have the function of assuring the organism's own path to death. Freud retracted this hypothesis as soon as he advanced it, but his formulations in civilization and its discontents seem to restore its essential content. And the fact that the destruction of life, human and animal, has progressed with the progress of civilization, that cruelty and hatred and the scientific extermination of men have increased in relation to the real possibility of the elimination of oppression, this feature of late industrial civilization would have instinctual roots which perpetuate destructiveness beyond all rationality. The growing mastery of nature, then, would, with the growing productivity of labor, develop and fulfill the human needs only as a byproduct. Increasing cultural wealth and knowledge would provide the material for progressive destruction and the need for increasing instinctual repression. This thesis implies the existence of objective criteria for gauging the degree of instinctual repression at a given stage of civilization. However, repression is largely unconscious and automatic, while its degree is measurable only in the light of consciousness. The differential between phylogenetically necessary repression and surplus repression may provide the criteria. Within the total structure of the repressed personality, Surplus repression is that portion which is the result of specific societal conditions sustained in the specific interest of domination. The extent of the surplus repression provides the standard of measurement. The smaller it is, the less repressive is the stage of civilization. The distinction is equivalent to that between the biological and the historical sources of human suffering. Of the three sources of human suffering which Freud enumerates, namely the superior force of nature, the disposition to decay of our bodies, and the inadequacy of our methods of regulating human relations in the family, the community, and the state. At least the first and the last are in a strict sense historical sources. The superiority of nature and the organization of societal relations have essentially changed in the development of civilization. Consequently, the necessity of repression and of the suffering derived from it varies with the maturity of civilization, with the extent of the achieved rational mastery of nature and of society. Objectively, the need for instinctual inhibition and restraint depends on the need for toil and delayed satisfaction. The same and even a reduced scope of instinctual regimentation would constitute a higher degree of repression at a mature stage of civilization when the need for renunciation and toil is greatly reduced by material and intellectual progress. When civilization could actually afford a considerable release 
of instinctual energy expended for domination and toil. Scope and intensity of instinctual repression obtain their full significance only in relation to the historically possible extent of freedom. For Freud, is progress in civilization progress in freedom? We have seen that Freud's theory is focused on the recurrent cycle, domination, rebellion, domination. But the second domination is not simply a, rep a repetition of the first one. The cyclical movement is progress in domination. From the primal father via the brother clan to the system of institutional authority characteristic of mature civilization, domination becomes increasingly impersonal, objective, universal, and also increasingly rational, effective, productive. At the end, under the rule of the fully developed performance principle, subordination appears as implemented through the social division of labor itself. Although physical and personal force remains an indispensable instrumentality. Society emerges as a lasting and expanding system of useful performances. The hierarchy of functions and relations assumes the form of objective reason. Law and order are identical with the life of society itself. In the same process, repression too is depersonalized. Constraint and regimentation of pleasure now become a function and natural result of the social division of labor. To be sure, the father, as paterfamilias, still performs the basic regimentation of the instincts which prepares the child for the surplus repression on the part of society during his adult life. But the father performs this function as the representative of the family's position in the social division of labor, rather than as the possessor of the mother. Subsequently, the individual's instincts are controlled through the social utilization of his labor power. He has to work in order to live, and this work requires not only 8, 10, 12 daily hours of his time, and therefore a corresponding diversion of energy, but also during these hours and the remaining ones, a behavior in conformity with the standards and morals of the performance principle. Historically, the reduction of eros to procreative monogamic sexuality, which completes the subjection of the pleasure principle to the reality principle, is consummated only when the individual has become a subject object of labor in the apparatus of his society, whereas ontogenetically, the primary suppression of infantile sexuality remains the precondition for this accomplishment. The development of a hierarchical system of social labor not only rationalizes domination, but also contains the rebellion against domination. At the individual level, the primal revolt is contained within the framework of the normal Oedipus conflict. At the societal level, recurrent rebellions and revolutions have been followed by counter-revolutions and restorations. From the slave revolts in the ancient world to the socialist revolution, the struggle of the oppressed has ended in establishing a new, better system of domination. Progress has taken place through an improving chain of control. Each revolution has been the conscious effort to replace one ruling group by another, but each revolution has also released forces that have overshot the goal, that have striven for the abolition of domination and exploitation. The ease with which they have been defeated demands explanations. Neither the prevailing constellation of power, nor immaturity of the productive forces, nor absence of class consciousness provides an adequate answer. In every revolution, there seems to have been a historical moment when the struggle against domination might have been victorious, but the moment passed. An element of self-defeat seems to be involved in this dynamic, regardless of the validity of such reasons as the prematurity and inequality of forces. In this sense, every revolution has also been a betrayed revolution. Freud's hypothesis on the origin and the perpetuation of guilt feeling elucidates, in psychological terms, the sociological dynamic it explains the identification of those who revolt with the power against which they revolt. The economic and political incorporation of the individuals into the hierarchical system of labor 
is accompanied by an instinctual process in which the human objects of domination reproduce their own repression. And the increasing rationalization of power seems to be reflected in an increasing rationalization of repression. In retaining the individuals as instruments of labor, forcing them into renunciation and toil, domination no longer merely or primarily sustains specific privileges, but also sustains society as a whole on an expanding scale. The guilt of rebellion is thereby greatly intensified. The revolt against the primal father eliminated an individual person who could be and was replaced by other persons. But when the dominion of the father has expanded into the dominion of society, no such replacement seems possible and the guilt becomes fatal. Rationalization of guilt feeling has been completed. The father restrained in the family and in his individual biological authority is resurrected far more powerful in the administration which preserves the life of society and in the laws which preserve the administration. These final and most sublime incarnations of the father cannot be overcome symbolically by emancipation. There's no freedom from administration and its laws because they appear as the ultimate guarantors of liberty. The revolt against them would be the supreme crime again, this time not against the despot animal who forbids gratification, but against the wise order which secures the goods and services for the progressive satisfaction of human needs. Rebellion now appears as the crime against the whole of human society and therefore as beyond reward and beyond redemption. However, the very progress of civilization tends to make this rationality a spurious one. The existing liberties and the existing gratifications are tied to the requirements of domination. They themselves become instruments of repression. The excuse of scarcity, which has justified institutionalized repression since its inception, weakens as man's knowledge and control over nature enhances the means for fulfilling human needs with a minimum of toil. The still prevailing impoverishment of vast areas of the world is no longer due chiefly to the poverty of human and natural resources, but to the manner in which they are distribu distributed and utilized. This difference may be irrelevant to politics and to politicians, but it is of decisive importance to a theory of civilization which derives the need for repression from the natural and perpetual disproportion between human desires and the environment in which they must be satisfied. If such a natural condition and not certain political and social institutions provides the rationale for repression, then it has become irrational. The culture of industrial civilization has turned the human organism into an ever more sensitive, differentiated, exchangeable instrument and has created a social wealth sufficiently great to transform this instrument into an end in itself. The available resources make for a qualitative change in the human needs. Rationalization and mechanization of labor tend to reduce the quantum of instinctual energy channeled into toil, alienated labor, thus freeing energy for the attainment of objectives set by the free play of individual faculties. Technology operates against the repressive utilization of energy insofar as it minimizes the time necessary for the production of the necessities of life, thus saving time for the development of needs beyond the realm of necessity and of necessary waste. But the closer the real possibility of liberating the individual from the constraints once justified by scarcity and immaturity, the greater the need for maintaining and streamlining these constraints, lest the established order of domination dissolve. Civilization has to defend itself against the specter of a world which could be free. If society cannot use its growing productivity for reducing repression, because such usage would upset the hierarchy of the status quo, productivity must be turned against the individuals. It becomes itself an instrument of universal control. Totalitarianism spreads over late industrial civilization wherever the interests of domination prevail upon productivity, 
arresting and diverting its potentialities. The people have to be kept in a state of permanent mobilization, internal and, and, and external. The rationality of dom domination has progress, progressed to the point where it threatens to invalidate its foundations. Therefore, it must be reaffirmed more effectively than ever before. This time, there shall be no killing of the father, not even a symbolic killing, because he may not find a successor. The atomization of the superego indicates the defense mechanisms by which society meets the threat. The defense consists chiefly in a strengthening of controls, not so much over the instincts as over consciousness, which, if left free, might recognize the work of repression in the bigger and better satisfaction of needs. The manipulation of consciousness, which has occurred throughout the orbit of contemporary industrial civilization, has been described in the various interpretations of totalitarian and popular cultures, coordination of the private and public existence of spontaneous and required reactions. The promotion of thoughtless leisure activities, the triumph of anti-intellectual ideologies, exemplify the trend. This extension of controls to formerly free regions of consciousness and leisure permits a relaxation of sexual taboos, previously more important because the overall controls were less effective. Today, compared with the Puritan and Victorian periods, sexual freedom has unquestionably increased although a reaction against the 1920s is clearly noticeable. At the same time, however, the sexual relations themselves have become much more closely assimilated with social relations. Sexual liberty is harmonized with profitable conformity. The fundamental antagonism between sex and social utility, itself the reflex of the conflict between pleasure principle and reality principle, is blurred by the progressive encroachment of the reality principle on the pleasure principle. In a world of alienation, the liberation of Eros would necessarily operate as a destructive, fatal force, as the total negation of the principle which governs the repressive reality. It is not an accident that the great literature of Western civilization celebrates only the unhappy love, that the Tristan myth has become its representative expression. The morbid romanticism of the myth is in a strict sense realistic. In contrast to the destructiveness of the liberated Eros, the relaxed sexual morality within the firmly entrenched system of monopolistic controls itself serves the system. The negation is coordinated with the positive, the night with the day, the dream world with the work world, fantasy with frustration. Then the individuals who relax in this uniformly controlled reality recall not the dream, but the day, not the fairy tale, but its denunciation. In their erotic relations, they keep their appointments with charm, with romance, with their favorite commercials. But within the system of unified and intensified controls, decisive changes are taking place. They affect the structure of the superego and the content and manifestation of guilt feelings Moreover, they tend toward a state in which the completely alienated world, expending its full power, seems to prepare the stuff and material for a new reality principle. The superego is loosened from its origin, and the traumatic experience of the father is superseded by more exogenous images. As the family becomes less decisive in directing the adjustment of the individual to society, the father-son conflict no longer remains the model conflict. This change derives from the fundamental economic processes which have characterized, since the beginning of the century, the transformation of free into organized capitalism. The independent family enterprise and, subsequently, the independent personal enterprise cease to be the units of the social system. They are being absorbed into large-scale impersonal groupings and associations. At the same time, the social value of the individual is measured primarily in terms of standardized skills and qualities of adjustment rather than autonomous judgment and personal responsibility. 
the technological abolition of the individual is reflected in the decline of the social function of the family. It was formerly the family which, for good or bad, reared and educated the individual, and the dominant rules and values were transmitted personally and transformed through personal fate. To be sure, in the Oedipus situation, not individuals but generations, units of the genus, faced each other, but in the passing and inheritance of the Oedipus conflict, they became individuals, and the conflict continued into an individual life history. Through this struggle with the father and mother as personal targets of love and aggression, the younger generation entered societal life with impulses, ideas, and needs which were largely their own. Consequently, the formation of their superego, the repressive modification of their impulses, the renunciation and sublimation were very personal experiences. Precisely because of this, their adjustment left painful scars and life under the performance principle still retain a sphere of private nonconformity. Now, however, under the rule of economic, political, and cultural monopolies, the formation of the mature superego seems to skip the stage of individualization. The generic atom becomes directly a social atom. The repressive organization of the instincts seems to be collective and the ego seems to be prematurely socialized by a whole system of extra-familial agents and agencies. As early as the preschool level, gangs, radios, and television set, the pattern for conformity and rebellion, deviations from the pattern are punished not so much within the family as outside and against the family. The experts of the mass media transmit the required values, they offer the perfect training and efficiency, toughness, personality, dream, and romance. With this education, the family can no longer compete. In the struggle between the generations, the sides seem to be shifted. The son knows better. He represents the mature reality principle against its obsolescent paternal forms. The father, the first object of aggression in the Oedipus situation, later appears as a rather inappropriate target of aggression. His authority as transmitter of wealth, skills, experiences is greatly reduced. He has less to offer and therefore less to prohibit. The progressive father is a most unsuitable enemy and a most unsuitable ideal. But so is any father who no longer shapes the child's economic, emotional, and intellectual future. Still, the prohibitions continue to prevail. The repressive control of the instincts persists, and so does the aggressive impulse. Who are the father substitutes against which it is primarily directed? As domination congeals into a system of objective administration, the images that guide the development of the superego become depersonalized. Formerly, the superego was fed by the master, the chief, the principal. These represented the re reality principle and their tangible personality, harsh and benevolent, cruel and rewarding. They provoked and punished the desire to revolt. The enforcement of conformity was their personal function and responsibility. Respect and fear could therefore be accompanied by hate of what they were and did as persons. They presented a living object for the impulses and for the conscious efforts to satisfy them. But these personal father images have gradually disappeared behind the institutions. With the rationalization of the productive apparatus, with the multiplication of functions, all domination assumes the form of administration. At its peak, the concentration of economic power seems to turn into anonymity. Everyone, even at the very top, appears to be powerless before the movements and laws of the apparatus itself. Control is normally administered by offices in which the controlled are the employers and the employed. The masters no longer perform an individual function. The sadistic principles, the capitalist exploiters, have been transformed into salaried members of a bureaucracy, whom their subjects meet as members of another bureaucracy. The pain, frustration, impotence of the individual derive from a highly productive an efficiently functioning system in which he makes a better living than ever before. Responsibility for the organization of his life lies with the whole, 
the system, the sum total of the institutions that determine, satisfy, and control his needs. The aggressive impulse plunges into a void, or rather the hate encounters smiling colleagues, busy competitors, obedient officials, helpful social workers who are all doing their duty and who are all innocent victims. Thus repulsed aggression is again introjected, not suppression, but the suppressed is guilty. Guilty of what? Material and intellectual progress has weakened the force of religion below the point where it can sufficiently explain the sense of guilt. The aggressiveness turned against the ego threatens to become senseless. With his consciousness coordinated, his privacy abolished, his emotions integrated into conformity, the individual has no longer enough mental space for developing himself against his sense of guilt, for living with a conscience of his own. His ego has shrunk to such a degree that the multiform antagonistic processes between id, ego, and superego cannot unfold themselves in their classic form. Still, the guilt is there. It seems to be a quality of the whole rather than of the individual's. Collective guilt, the affliction of an institutional system which wastes and arrests the material and human resources at its disposal. The extent of these resources can be defined by the level of fulfilled human freedom attainable through truly rational use of the productive capacity. If this standard is applied, it appears that, in the centers of industrial civilization, man is kept in a state of impoverishment, both cultural and physical. Most of the cliches with which sociolo sociology describes the process of dehumanization in present-day mass culture are correct, but they seem to be slanted in the wrong direction. What is retrogressive what is retrogressive is not mechanization and standardization, but their containment, not the universal coordination, but its concealment under spurious liberties, choices, and individual individualities. The high standard of living in the domain of the great corporations is restrictive in a concrete sociological sense. The goods and services that the individuals buy control by control their needs and petrify their faculties. In exchange for the commodities that enrich their life, the individuals sell not only their labor, but also their free time. <clears throat> the better living is offset by the all-pervasive control over living. People dwell in apartment concentrations and have private automobiles with which they can no longer escape into a different world. They have huge refrigerators filled with frozen foods. They have dozens of newspapers and magazines that espouse the same ideals. They have innumerable choices, innumerable gadgets, which are all of the same sort and keep them occupied and divert their attention from the real issue, which is the awareness that they could both work less and determine their own needs and satisfactions. The ideology of today lies in that production and consumption, reproduce and justify domination but their ideological character does not change the fact that their benefits are real. The repressiveness of the whole lies to a high degree in its efficacy. It enhances the scope of material culture, facilitates the procurement of the necessities of life, makes comfort and luxury cheaper, draws ever larger areas into the orbit of industry, while at the same time sustaining toil and destruction. The individual pays by sacrificing his time, his consciousness, his dreams. Civilization pays by sacrificing its own promises of liberty, justice, and peace for all. <clears throat> the discrepancy between potential liberation and actual repression has come to maturity. It permeates all spheres of life the world over. The rationality of progress heightens the rationality of its organization and direction. Social cohesion and administrative power are sufficiently strong to protect the whole from direct aggression, but not strong enough to eliminate the accumulated aggressiveness. It turns against those who do not belong to the whole, whose existence is its denial. This foe appears as the arch enemy and antichrist himself. He is everywhere at all times. He represents hidden and sin sinister forces, and his omnipresence requires total mobilization. The difference between war and peace, between civilian and military populations, 
between truth and propaganda is blotted out. There is regression to historical stages that had been passed long ago, and this regression reactivates the sadomasochistic phase on a national and international scale. But the impulses of this phase are reactivated in a new, civilized manner. Practically, without sublimation, they become socially useful. Activities in concentration and labor camps, colonial and civil wars, impunitive expeditions, and so on. Under these circumstances, the question whether the present stage of civilization is demonstrably more destructive than the preceding ones does not seem to be very relevant. In any case, the question cannot be avoided by pointing to the destructiveness prevalent throughout history. The destructiveness of the present stage reveals its false significance only if the present is measured, not in terms of past stages, but in terms of its own potentialities. There is more than a quantitative difference in whether wars are waged by professional armies in confined spaces or against entire populations on a global scale, whether technical inventions that can make the world free from misery are used for the conquest or for the creation of suffering, whether thousands are slain in combat or millions scientifically exterminated with the help of doctors and engineers, whether exiles can find refuge across the frontiers or are chased around the earth, whether people are naturally ignorant or are being made ignorant by their daily intake of information and entertainment. It is with a new ease that terror is assimilated with normality and destructiveness with, con con with construction. Still, progress continues and continues to narrow the basis of repression. At the height of its progressive achievements, domination not only undermines its own foundations, but also corrupts and liquidates the opposition against domination. What remains is the negativity of reason, which impels wealth and power and generates a climate in which the instinctual roots of the performance principle are drying up. The alienation of labor is almost complete. The mechanics of the assembly line, the routine of the office, the ritual of buying and selling are freed from any connection with human potentialities. Work relations have become to a great extent relations between persons as exchangeable objects, scientific management and efficiency experts. To be sure, the still prevailing competitiveness requires a certain degree of individuality and spontaneity. But these features have become just as superficial and illusory as the competitiveness to which they belong. Individuality is literally in name only. In the specific representation of types, such as vamp, housewife, ondine, he-man, career woman, struggling young couple, just as competition tends to be reduced to prearranged varieties in the production of gadgets, wrappings, flavors, colors, and so on. Beneath this illusory surface, the whole work world and its recreation have become a system of animate and inanimate things, all equally subject to administration. The human existence is this, in this world is mere stuff, matter, material, which does not have the principle of its movement in itself. This state of ossification also affects the instincts, their inhibitions and modifications. Their original dynamic becomes static. The interactions between ego, superego, and id conge congeal into automatic reactions. Corporealization of the superego is accompanied by corporalization of the ego, manifest in the frozen traits and gestures produced at the appropriate occasions and hours. Consciousness increasingly less burdened by autonomy tends to be reduced to the task of regulating the coordination of the individual with the whole. This coordination is effective to such a degree that the general unhappiness has decreased rather than increased. We have suggested that the individual's awareness of the prevailing repression is blunted by the manipulated restriction of his consciousness. This process alters the contents of happiness. The concept denotes a more than private, more than subjective condition. Happiness is not in the mere feeling of satisfaction, but in the reality of freedom and satisfaction. Happiness involves knowledge. It is the prerogative of the animal rationale. With the decline in consciousness, with the control of information, with the absorption of individual into mass communication, 
knowledge is administered and confined. The individual does not really know what is going on. The overpowering machine of education and entertainment unites him with all the others in a state of anesthesia from which all detrimental ideas tend to be excluded. And since knowledge of the whole truth is hardly in, hardly conducive to happiness, such general anesthesia may, makes individuals happy. If anxiety is more than a general malaise, if it is an, ex, an existential condition, then this so-called age of anxiety is distinguished by the extent by which anxiety has disappeared from expression. These trends seem to suggest that the expenditure of energy and effort for developing one's own inhibitions is greatly diminished. The living links between the individual and his culture are loosened. This culture was, in and for the individual, the system of inhibitions that generated and regenerated the predominant values and in institutions. Now the repressive force of the reality principle seems no longer renewed and rejuvenated by the repressed individuals. The less they function as the agents and victims of their own life, the less is the reality principle strengthened through creative identifications and sublimations, which enrich and at the same time protect the household of culture. The groups and group ideals, the philosophies, the works of art and literature that still express without compromise the fears and hopes of humanity stand against the prevailing reality principle. They are its absolute denunciation. The positive aspects of progressive alienation show forth. The human energies which sustain the performance principle are becoming increasingly dispensable. The automization of necessity and waste of labor and entertainment precludes the realization of individual potentialities in this realm. It repels libidinal cathexis. The ideology of scarcity, of the productivity of toil, domination, and renunciation is dislodged from its instinctual as well as rational ground. The theory of alienation demonstrated the fact that man does not realize himself in his labor, that his life has become an instrument of labor, that his work and its products have assumed a form and power independent of him as an individual. But the liberation from this state seems to require not the arrest of alienation, but its consummation, not the reactivation of the repressed and productive personality, but its abolition, the elimination of human potentiality, potentialities from the world of alienated labor creates the preconditions for the elimination of labor from the world of human potentialities. <laughs>